Good afternoon. This is the Ohio Senate District 2 debate brought to you by the Sandusky Register and BGSU Firelands College as a public service. This debate is between incumbent State Senator Teresa Gavarone and her challenger, Democrat Joe o o Dorisio. We're going to meet the candidates in just a moment, but before we do, I want to mention again that this debate is brought to you by Bowling Green State University, Firelands College as a public service, and we want to thank Firelands College for helping produce this debate, part of a series of five debates brought to you by the Sandusky Register and the Norwalk Reflector. You can see those debates on demand viewing at SanduskyRegister.com and also at our YouTube channel. Yesterday we had a debate between the Huron County Commissioner candidates. We also had a debate between the 89th House District candidates. And there's an interview with U.S. Representative Jim Jordan also uh, that we uh, produced yesterday. So please go view those uh, segments and watch this segment and share this information with your friends. This debate and all of our debates will be available for demand viewing through Election Day, November 3rd. With that, I'll just quickly uh, indicate what the rules of engagement are. Each candidate will have a one-minute opening statement. Each candidate will have one minute to answer each question and up to 30 seconds to respond or rebut their opponent's answer. And each candidate will get a 90-second closing statement. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, reporters Tom Jackson and Brandon Adio will be asking the questions. I'm Matt Westerholt, Managing Editor of the Register, and this debate is being co-produced by Aaron Caldwell, the Chief Photographer and Reporter with the Sandusky Register. And with that, we'll introduce our candidates, or we'll let our candidates introduce themselves. And we've been going with the opening statement from the incumbent, I believe, is what we decided. Uh, your opening statement. Thank you, Matt. And I certainly want to thank the Sandusky Register for um, giving the opportunity to have a debate and have a discussion and inform the voters on the candidates in these races. Uh, so I'm State Senator Teresa Gavarone, and I currently serve the 2nd Senate District, live in Bowling Green. Um, prior to that, I served in the Ohio House, and I also served in local government, uh, city council in Bowling Green. Um, i mother of three, I'm a small business owner, a little restaurant in a college town, and uh, also been an attorney for 26 years. I graduated with my business degree from Bowling Green State University, my law degree from University of Toledo, and in times like this, the pandemic uh, that we're going through, experience matters. It's important. Um, I know the law. I know the impact of the decisions we make in Columbus. And I'm going to continue to work in a bipartisan manner to make sure Ohio is the greatest place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you, State Senator Gavron and Mr. Odorisio. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to your viewers. Um, so I'm Joel Odorisio. I'm a father, I'm an educator, and I'm a union organizer. Uh, I've been I've doing my best to give back to my community through my teaching and through the work that I do as an artist. And uh, over the last 10 years, I've been contributing heavily to my union and the people that I work with through the work that I'm doing for my union. So the work that I uh, have been doing for the AAUP has been inspiring. Uh, I know that by working together, we can create positive change for our community, and I'm ready to go to Columbus and work for work for the people of our district. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Odorisio. Yep. And with that, we're going to start with our first question from reporter Tom Jackson. All right. Uh, thank you, candidates. Do you support replacement legislation to bail out Ohio's two nuclear energy plants? If so, how do you envision that being accomplished? And if you're opposed, then why is that? And we'll start with you, sir. Uh, absolutely, I support replacement legislation. 
Uh, this is a difficult issue for me. As a union organizer, I know that the jobs that are at that plant are very important. On the other hand, I know that we can't accept that level of corruption as the cost of doing business in, in Ohio. Uh, for the past 15 years, we've seen scandal after scandal in the Republican House, and uh, we can't keep expecting the FBI to bail us out. I know that we need, to, we need the economic anchor that that plant provides for our community, but we need to make sure that any legislation that's devised to deal with that happens uh, with transparency and with all of the constituents that are affected at the table. Thank you, sir. And Senator Gavro. Thank you. Um, I do not support repeal of House Bill 6. Um, um, this, my opponent here uh, talks about corruption, but uh, Democrats and Republicans voted for House Bill 6 in the House. Um, Davis Bessey means so much to this area in terms of the jobs, the, the thousands of people who are employed directly and indirectly, the, the money that is generated from, from taxes pays for our schools and our emergency services and our libraries and other things. Not only that, nuclear energy provides 90% of Ohio's carbon-free energy, and we need a diverse energy portfolio to keep our energy costs low. Uh, House Bill 6 also created a net decrease in everyone's um, energy bills, which is really important. But um, my opponent here has been endorsed by the Ohio Environmental Council, which uh, its, its top priority is bringing down nuclear energy and repealing House Bill 6. Thank you, uh, State Senator Gavril. And I, I don't know if I mentioned, but each candidate will have up to 30 seconds to rebut the answer of their opponent, if you wish to. And I also want to mention that State Senate, uh, the district, Senate District 2 includes Erie County, Ottawa County, Lucas County, and Wood County. And Fulton. And Fulton, Fulton yeah. County. Uh, with that, we're, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, I board. would like to rebut it. Please go ahead. So, um, without a doubt, the jobs that are provided by Davis Bessie are very important to our community. But we have other equally important jobs here in the district. First Solar is one of the largest solar manufacturers in the country. Uh, a, they are a manufacturer in this area. This bill has put a $1.4 billion corruption tax on every manufacturer in the state of Ohio. So we can't just be focused on a few jobs that are in our area, although they're deeply important. We need to make sure that we're doing what's right for Ohio and the ratepayers here in Ohio. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next question, but let me just, just reiterate. So you oppose repeal of House Bill 6, so you want the, the bailout to stand just as it is. May I respond? Yes. Okay. Um, the bill that left the House was very different than the bill that passed in the Senate. The bill that passed in the Senate um, was good policy. It. Uh, allows Davis Bessie to continue operating. It lowers your energy bills. It uh, keeps those jobs in place, but it also count, it, it provides accountability. There are audits every year. And it, uh, it changed drastically. We had a, I think it was like a 28 page comp doc when you compared what left the House versus what left the Senate. The, House, the Senate re reinstated a lot of the renewable portfolio standards so that um, we're able to uh, lessen the impact on certain communities. So um, there was a lot of uh, good policy in House Bill 6. Okay. And it was a, a very different process in the Senate than it was in so the House. You, su you support the legislation as it stands now. Mm -hmm. You want to repeal the legislation and replace it. So you, yes. you support the bailout, but you want it to be redone. I support good jobs in our community. And we need to take a holistic look at how we best um, we best support jobs in our community. I would like I ha I can't let this ride. You helped write the bill in the House and then voted on it in the Senate. Um, may I respond Please to go that? Ahead. No, I wasn't in the House. I left the House um, uh, within a month of being sworn into the House. I, I started in the Senate February sixth of twenty nineteen. 
Um, the bill was so being I never worked served, on for two years. I never served under Larry Householder. And I didn't vote on it in the House. I only voted on it in the Senate. And when it came from the House to the Senate, we took a new look at it, and we changed it quite dramatically. And uh, got bipartisan support in the Senate. Okay. And we'll move on to the next question. This one from reporter Brandon Adio. Thank you, Matt. So this is a related question. Federal prosecutors contend that State Representative Larry Householder and others were bribed in a $60 million scheme to approve the nuclear bailout known as House Bill 6. For both of you, what are your concerns about corruption at the State House, and what reforms, in your view, are needed to prevent it? And we'll start with you, Senator Gabriel. Thank you. Um, I voted against Larry Householder for Speaker. Larry Householder became a speaker because the majority of the Democrats voted him in as speaker. Um, and the allegations against him are quite serious. Um, but as an attorney, I do have faith in the judicial system and that the wrongdoers will be held accountable for their actions. Um, regarding uh, Regarding the allegations, I do believe there needs to be greater transparency. And the people we serve have a right to, to know who is contributing to our campaigns. I, I think uh, transparency is, uh, is very important going forward. Very good. And, sir? I grew up here in Ohio. I remember a time when we had balanced government here in Ohio. Um, and looking back over the last 20 years of single party Republican rule, I remember many, many, many scandals. So uh, when I first started at Bowling Green, I remember the Noe Coingate scandal, where Republican donors were allowed to take money from workers' compensation fund and invest it in, in, in um, abnormal investment. Lost $50 million of workers' money. I remember ECOT, where Republican donors were given money from our public schools to run an, an internet schooling scam, where we, we don't even know if they actually educated any kids. So we're suing them to get the money back. And now we have this $61 million scandal with our, our public energy money. We need balance back in Columbus. We need to take charge of our, of our own government so that we have accountability in government. We can't keep waiting for the FBI to bail us out. Thank you, candidate O'Dericio. And with that, we'll move on to our next question, which is coming from Tom Jackson. Uh, my question is an education question. Has the state provided too much, not enough, or just about the right amount of public money to private and or charter schools? And are public schools being shortchanged under our current system? And Mr. Odoricio, we'll start that with you. Well, we really need to talk about um, the voucher program and charter schools separately. We've worked for decades to um, have strong public schools and to make sure that uh, every child in Ohio has an equitable chance at an education. We've also known for 20 years that we do not have a constitutionally acceptable method of funding our schools. Right now, we rely very heavily on property taxes to fund local public schools. Charter schools are a fantastic way to explore new types of education, but we've allowed them to be unaccountable. Uh, we need to make sure that charter schools are accountable to the same levels and qualities of accessibility and strong uh, teachers as public schools are. And vouchers, I absolutely can't support at all. It's important to keep public money in public schools. Um, I, you know, absolutely support the right of parents to choose to send their children to private schools, but we can't be, we can't leave kids behind to subsidize private education. Thank you, sir. And Senator Gavarro. Thank you. Um, education has to be among our highest priorities. I'm a mother of three kids who all attended Bowling Green City Schools and uh, graduated from there, and, and every child in Ohio, we need to make sure that they have the tools and the education they need to be prepared for that next step, whether it's going on to college or going into the workforce. So we need to make sure we're, we're doing what we can to give our teachers the tools to, to provide that quality education and, um, 
and make sure we're giving those kids and those families the education that they deserve. Um, in recent General Assemblies, there has been legislation to hold greater accountability and transparency for the charter schools, but, you know, there's more work to do. Um, there's currently a new funding formula that's uh, going through the legislative process in the House. Um, it's known as the C Patterson model, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing that continue to move through the process and seeing what we can do to really examine the way our school systems are funded to make sure our kids have the education they deserve. Thank you very much. And with that, I want to mention that this Ohio Senate District 2 debate is being brought to you by BGSU Firelands College as a public service. And we want to make sure to thank the college for supporting this public service and this debate. And with that, we'll move on to our next question. I think it comes from reporter Tom Jacks. No, Brandon Adio. Adio. Another education question. What legislative reforms, if any, do you support to make higher education more affordable? And we'll start with you, State Senator Gavron. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, as a mother of three who, um, for two years ago, I had all three in college at the same time. Um, two have since graduated. I still have one in college, but college affordable is, affordability is something that um, really hits home to not just me, but families all over the state of Ohio. So um, we've worked on legislation that will um, encourage schools to do a four-year guarantee so when your kids start school, um, they know what the tuition is going to be four years later. Also encouraging schools to look at textbook costs to um, make sure that uh, we're providing affordable textbooks for our kids are requiring those. But uh, we need to make sure that um, Ohio is a place where people want to send their kids to college, where people will come from out of state to attend, and uh, once they get here, that they stay in Ohio. So um, there's more work to do, and I certainly um, look forward to continuing that work as the, currently the Vice Chair of Higher Education. Thank you. Thank you, and candidate O'Doricio. I'll tell you that this is one of the reasons I've run for office. Each year I see it getting harder and harder for my students to afford an education. I can tell you that the biggest reason that students drop out of school is because they can't afford the gap between what they can afford to pay and what financial aid covers for them. So I've seen students drop out of school for $100 or $500 or $1,000. I've seen students fail a class because they can't afford the books. I, we can't have that as a state. I know that we've done better. I went to Ohio State in the 80s, and I know that uh, the state of Ohio covered 70% of my share of instruction for in-state tuition. And right now, Ohio covers 20% of in-state tuition. What that means is that each student at BG is paying $10,000 a year more than if we had the same level of funding as when I went to school. We've done it in the past, and I know we can do it in the future. We need to quit playing shell games with our state's money and put invest the money where we know it needs to be. Thank you, sir. Okay. And please go ahead. Yes, I, I would also like to point out that we increased in last budget uh, OCAW need-based aid for our students to help make it more affordable. And also, um, we need to encourage um, students to fill out the federal financial aid. I, I had heard a statistic, uh, I believe it was 37%, something like that, of uh, students who are eligible for federal aid aren't filling out those forms. So we need to make sure we're encouraging students to, to get all the aid they need to get that education with as little debt as possible. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next question, and this question comes from reporter Tom Jackson. Addiction has caused thousands of deaths in Ohio. Is the state doing enough to assist recovery what are the best state programs in your view, and what needs to happen to improve recovery services in Ohio? Candidate O'Doricio. Uh, in 2018, nearly 4,000 Ohioans died from opioid overdose. We have one of the highest rates of overdose in the nation. We've been trying to deal with this as a policing issue for decades, and what we really need to do is deal with this as a health crisis. We need, uh, we need counseling services. We need rehabilitation. We need to make sure that citizens of Ohio that are struggling with addiction can continue to live productive lives while they're going through a course of treatment. 
um, rather than just warehouse them in prisons. And we need to, honestly, we need to reassess our drug policy. Uh, why are we putting our kids in jail for a joint and we're letting pharmaceutical companies sell billions of dollars of synthetic heroin on our streets? We can't continue to go on like this. Thank you, sir. And State Senator Gavron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the Senate just passed Senate Bill 3, which is over in the House, which addresses some of the concerns you're raising now. But I've got to say that uh, the opiate crisis, the drug addiction crisis, mental health service, connection to resources, is one of the reasons I sought the seat in the legislature to begin with. It's what I was seeing in my law practice, um, how it was impacting families and, and kids and, and the court system and jails. And it's one of the reasons I'm here. So I've, I've done a lot of work in this realm. There's so much more to do. Um, I passed legislation that uh, would create, provide data for our local boards, timely data so they can respond. They can see if there's an uptick in overdoses and respond more timely. I have sponsored legislation that increases the level of offense for people caught trafficking drugs within the vicinity of a rehab clinic. I've also um, sponsored legislation that makes use of fake urine to cheat a drug test a criminal offense. And um, you know, for my work, I was awarded Legislator of the Year from the County Behavioral Health Association in Ohio. Um, it, it's important work, and it's what drives me, but um, there's a lot more to do. Thank you for that answer. I would just like to point Please out go ahead. that all of those solutions are increasing the criminal penalties for a health crisis rather than dealing with uh, the necessary action of offering treatment to the people that are dealing with it. Can I respond to that? Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, increasing the level of offense for drug traffickers within the vicinity of a rehab clinic. These are people who are preying on the vulnerable person who has taken the step of getting um, rehabilitation and trying to better themselves. They sit outside. Some of them join group and they give people drugs to keep them hooked. It's a business model. They want to keep people addicted so that uh, they stay good customers. And we want to help people achieve success, get them across that finish line. Thank you. And we'll move on to our next question. And I think this question comes from reporter Brandon Adio. What did Governor Mike DeWine do well in handling the COVID-19 pandemic? And what did he not do well in his response? And we'll start with you, State Senator Gavro. Thank you. Well, I, I got to say that Governor DeWine's swift actions in the beginning of this, uh, this crisis, I, I believe it, it saved lives. I think um, he's done a lot of, uh, he's had to make a lot of really difficult decisions at a really difficult time for our state. Um, so there are a lot of things he did very well. His swift action, his taking control of this crisis um, has, has been very good. Now, I, I agree with many of his decisions, and as this goes on, um, you know, I don't agree with all of those decisions, but I believe that uh, his intentions have always been the best interest and health and safety of Ohioans. Thank you for that answer, and candidate Odoricio. I think early on what Governor DeWine did was listen to the experts. We had a fantastic director of public health, Amy Acton, who was giving us uh, the best medical advice that was available at the time. We put, a, um, we put public health orders in place that early on limited the spread. Quickly though, uh, Governor DeWine got pushed back from his own party. Uh, there's five bills uh, being pushed, pushing through right now to limit, uh, the, limit the power of the Department of Health and limit the, the power of the governor to protect our health in this time of crisis. So, um, in fact, my opponent sponsored SB 55, and SB 5 would allow people to ignore mass orders, um, encouraging the spread of this deadly disease. And please go ahead. Thank you. Um, actually, Senate Bill 55 was my bill that increases the level of offense for people caught trafficking drugs in the vicinity of a rehab clinic. Um, a member of the House threw an amendment in that actually um, eliminated the criminal penalties for violating health orders. So, at a time where we're looking at the criminal, the, the prison population, the jail population, and that communal setting, um, 
do we want to put more people in jail or wage hefty fines on people who are um, maybe struggling to get to pay their rent? But civil penalties remain in place under that amendment. So radical partisans changed your bill and you voted for it anyway, and it had to be vetoed by the governor. Can I respond? You go ahead. Um, you were just talking about people being released from jail for nonviolent offenses. We're talking about uh, putting people in jail. You think it's okay to put people in jail for violating a health order. That's what the amendment did. It just eliminated the criminal penalty. It did not eliminate the civil penalty for that. It's not my preference to have that put into my bill, though. And we'll move on to the next question from reporter Tom Jackson. Do you support mask mandates, social distancing, and crowd limitations under Ohio's current public health orders? Are you concerned that a portion of our population ignores those mandates? And we'll go with you, uh, candidate Odorizio. We're all in this together. Every single person that catches this um, is a cost to our community and a cost, a cost to families. We need to make sure that we're looking out for each other. So I do support mask mandates because right now, uh, the best medical advice shows that this slows the spread of the disease. Nothing is going to protect us from it entirely until we have a grip on um, a vaccine or a, a legitimate course of treatment. But in the meantime, we need to do our part as a community to slow the spread so that our hospitals don't get overwhelmed and so that uh, we can function as normally as possible within our economy. Thank you for that answer. And State Senator Gavarro. Thank you. Um, I believe mask mandates work best at the local level. Um, different parts of our state are very diverse. Um, some have more concentrated uh, population centers and maybe greater risk or different things going on. So I think um, mask, uh, mask mandates are, are best kept at the local level. Um, I'm not a medical expert, never claimed to be, but I certainly listen to those who are and uh, do my best to wear my mask and keep a social distance. Uh, would never want to put anyone at risk. Um, but I've seen firsthand the impact. Um, I, I've spoken with teachers and, and kids and parents, business owners. Heck, I am a business owner. I've seen firsthand the impact. And actually recent lo recently uh, lost a close family member in Florida to COVID. So I, I understand how difficult this is and certainly want to do what we can to keep everyone protected. Thank you for that answer. Well, I, I would like to say that this is not an individual problem, and we don't we we can't handle individual solutions. Um, we know that masks protect our community. I would like to point out that um, there's a number of bills working through uh, our legislature right now to limit the power of the governor to deal with these issues, and also to limit the power of the Ohio Department of Health to deal with these issues. And actually, partisan radicals are trying to impeach the governor right now over this very issue. So we need to make sure that we're working together as a community. We need to make sure that we're listening to experts. Thank you very much. Thank you for that answer. And we'll move on to the next question. And that question comes from reporter Brandon Adio. Given news reports about President Trump and members of the staff becoming infected with COVID-19, is it a good idea to wear masks at his rallies at all times? Uh, and, and in other words, were these prior rallies reckless for that reason? And we'll start with you, sir. We've seen COVID sweeping through our government recently. I have great empathy for every American citizen who's dealing with this issue. I think we need to remember that um, we need to have compassion as we are, um, as we're dealing with this. Uh, we do know that people are put at risk when they're in uh, large, situa large public situations, particularly at risk when they're not wearing masks. Um, so we need to be responsible as individuals and as a community. We need to each do our part. And, um, you know, for, not all of us have the same uh, access to medical care as the 
as the president, we need to make sure that every Ohio citizen who is stricken with this illness has coverage and has the ability to access our fantastic medical system. Thank you, sir. And State Senator Gavro. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I, I'm not a medical expert, um, but certainly try to listen to those who are and uh, certainly try to wear my mask at the, the rallies. But I think it's important that people follow the guidance and, and best practices, you know, for their own safety and for the safety of those around them. All right. Thank you. And we'll move on to, well, I want to mention that this Ohio Senate debate is brought to you by BGSU Firelands College as a public service. And we want to make sure to thank BGSU Firelands College for helping us provide this forum for voters. Uh, with that, we'll go on to our next question, which I think comes from reporter Tom Jackson. Governor DeWine has asked for weeks in his uh, press conferences to impose stricter laws for convicted felons who carry guns. Do you support this or any other changes in gun laws? Why or why not? And State Senator Gavron, we'll start with you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, regarding changes in gun laws, um, when we're looking at um, restricting the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens, um, we need to look at that language very carefully and listen to considerable public input. Um, when it comes to um, making Ohio safer, making things safer, we need to look at uh, really what's causing someone to want to harm people. Mental health, connecting people to services, identifying people who are a danger to the public, whether with a gun or with any other weapon or device. We need to identify people and connect people to help. Thank you for that answer and candidate Odorisio. I think Ohio is ready for common sense gun reform. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, uh, a recent poll of Ohioans found that 90% of Ohioans support a universal background check. So we need to close gun show loopholes that allow people to um, purchase a weapon without a background check. And, you know, we, we can support red flag laws that keep guns out of the hands of violent criminals. So um, it's not a mental health issue, it, it's a violence issue. So if we can identify people who are prone to violence and get guns out of their hands, that will make our community safer. Um, so I, I support common sense gun legislation that will protect our communities. Very good, thank you. And uh, Senator Gavin, do you uh, support red flag laws? I certainly would need to look at the language. Actually, when the Dayton incident took place mm -hmm. um, a year ago, I was actually at my high school reunion. I grew up in Dayton. I was just a few miles away mm -hmm. from that incident. That really hit uh, close to home. Um, and I knew people who knew people in, in that family. Um, and, you know, it's one of the reasons uh, we put $675 million in wraparound funding for the schools and making sure that we're better we're able to identify kids who need help, who are struggling. And wraparound funding is the uh, mental health services right. entirely for a family across the spectrum of services. For schools. I, I think it's really important that we are, are working to help identify people because, honestly, if you want to do harm to a large group of people, you don't necessarily have to have a gun. You can drive a truck up a sidewalk. You can, uh, gosh, I, I go back to thinking of the fertilizer and Timothy McVeigh at the Oklahoma um, Federal Building. It, it, there's a lot of ways that you can do harm, and we need to um, we need to protect people and look at what's ultimately going to achieve that goal. How are we going to protect society from dangerous people who wish to do harm? Thank you. I I have to Please say, go ahead. right now, uh, SB. 317 is being looked at and what this does is uh, this bill allows untrained teachers to have guns in classrooms uh, the fraternal order police just came out uh, opposed to this bill and my opponent had an opportunity to um, vote on an amendment that would make sure these teachers at least had training and instead of standing up for our kids 
she left the room and didn't vote on the amendment. Yes. Please go ahead. Um, yes. And I, I certainly understand that, that you don't have the same experience down in Columbus, but oftentimes there are multiple meetings going on at the same time or conflicting schedules. But believe me, when that comes to the Senate floor, I'll be voting on it. And how will you vote? Uh, I need to go through that legislation very carefully um, and, and look at all the testimony that's gone in. I see. And we'll move on to the next question from reporter Brandon Adio. Is there systemic racism in law enforcement agencies, the criminal justice system, and or other institutions? Uh, what should be done to address it if there is? And we'll start with you, State Senator Gambaro. Is there systemic racism in law enforcement agencies? Thank you. Um, Ohioans are ready for a conversation. I know there's a, a resolution that we've listened to. Um, I, I think it was maybe 20 witnesses. There were a large day um, was uh, spent listening to testimony on this very issue. Um, I think we need to have conversations. Ohio, we need to listen to people who feel that uh, that things are unfair. We need to understand better the perspectives of others, but we also need to include law enforcement in this conversation and really bring people together to find solutions that are going to um, have a lasting effect and keep everyone safer going forward. I've actually sponsored legislation um, to help people of all races, races and religions um, and certainly want to continue working with all. So I'm not sure, is that a yes, that you believe there is systemic racism in law enforcement? I believe we need to have some conversations and better understand those who believe that uh, there is systemic racism so we can understand those viewpoints and have a conversation with law enforcement okay. involved. Thank you for that clarification. Sir? I don't want to make sweeping statements about our law enforcement. I do know that there are individuals in law enforcement who are racist. I know there are individuals in everyday life that are racist. Uh, we can, um, I, I support eight common sense reforms in police that have been shown to reduce police violence. So um, these are the eight can't wait. We need to ban chokeholds and strangleholds. We need to require de-escalation. We need to require warning before shooting. We require officers to exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Officers have a duty to intervene. Uh, we need to ban shooting at moving vehicles. We need to require a use of force continuum. And we need to require comprehensive for, uh, reporting in our communities. So that doesn't um, accuse anyone of racism, but those are, uh, co those are um, concrete reforms that we can take that will reduce violence uh, when police are serving our communities. So I think the same question is back to you then, is, is, is there systemic racism in law enforcement agencies? There is racism in our nation, and we have never had a conversation to address the racism. Uh, each, we try over and over to um, make laws that will fix it. When I was growing up in Columbus, uh, Columbus Public Schools went through court-ordered desegregation. I was bused into a, uh, a majority-minority school. And, you know, we try to deal with racism, we try a different way to deal with racism, we try a different way to deal with racism. Uh, we need to have the strength as a society to openly address our history as a nation. Uh, I don't want to put that on police. I don't want to put it on legislatures. I don't want to put it on uh, white people. But we all need to look at the history we have as a nation of racism. So um, it's uncomfortable for me to talk about racism. I'm willing to do it because I care about people that are affected by racism. So I, I'll st I will stand beside my, my black brothers and sisters and support the changes that need to happen so that we can all move forward and be equal in America. Thank you for that answer, sir. And please. Um, I've worked with law enforcement um, through my 26 years as an attorney, through my work on city council, 
through my work in the House and my work in the Senate, and the vast majority of law enforcement night are doing things exactly right, and there's no one more disgusted by um, examples of excessive force than law enforcement. Um, it, it disrupts the public trust and, um, and tarnishes their good work. So we need to support our law enforcement, and we need to make sure that they're a part of the conversation and the solutions going forward. Thank you for that answer. And we'll move on to the next question from reporter Tom Jackson. Kind of a related question. Do you support diversity and anti-racism training for public workforces? Why or why not? And we're going to start with you, sir. Yes. And why? I, su I support training because it. I support uh, diversity training and racism training. Um, I'm not a perfect person. Uh, I know that I have uh, implicit bias. Uh, I struggle. I struggle with uh, the same. I struggle with race the same as every American does. So um, we can't change the way we grew up, but we absolutely can change the way we behave, and it's not going to happen unless we work on it. Thank you for that answer, State Senator Gavaro. Do you support diversity and anti-racism training for public workforces? Why or why not? I'm certainly always open to looking at the training to make sure we have the most effective uh, training possible for our law enforcement, make sure they're prepared for any situation. Um, certainly would, uh, would be open to looking at uh, um, revising or improving the training system for law enforcement, making sure that uh, our, our officers have the very best information and, and training going forward so they're ready for any scenario. Thank you for your answer. I would like to point out that this isn't just about law enforcement. This is about the public workforce. So I'm a member of the public workforce as a public teacher. It's important that I serve everyone that's in my classroom. So I have, again, this is wider than just a policing issue. It's for everyone in government to make sure that government serves our community equally. Thank you, sir. And one more time, I want to mention that this state senate debate is being brought to you by BGSU Firelands College as a public service. And we want to make sure to thank Firelands College for helping make this debate possible. It's one of a series of five debates brought to you by the Sandusky Register and the Norwalk Reflector. You can watch all the debates at our YouTube channel and at SanduskyRegister.com on demand. With that, we'll move to the next question, which comes from reporter Brandon Adio. Adio. What will be your top two priorities as a legislator if you win this election? And we'll start with you, State Senator Gavro. Thank you. Well, um, jobs in the economy and education going, going forward um, are, are going to be really important as we continue to man maneuver through this pandemic and come out the other side. We need to make sure there are jobs. Um, this pandemic has, has really kind of shed a light on things that we might be able to do differently. We want to make sure that education is fitting those workforce needs going forward and that we're ready to, um, to come back better and stronger than ever um, as things do get back to normal. And also, I want to continue working um, on Lake Erie. Water quality is so vitally important for um, not just this region, but for the state as a whole. Thank you, uh, State Senator Gavarone and candidate Odoricio. Um, this is two issues but it's one purpose. We need a strong community. So as an educator, I want to make sure that we have a strong, equitable public education system. We need early childhood care. Uh, we need pre-kindergarten programs for those families that want it. We need a strong public education system for K through 12 schools. And once our kids graduate from high school, we need an affordable path to success for them. So that could be professional training, it could be a two-year degree, it could be an affordable four-year degree. So education is one of my priorities. And then um, once our students are done with their education, we need a strong economy for them. And a strong economy starts with workers. 
We need a dignified living wage for every worker in Ohio, and we need to make sure that we're protecting the right to bargain collectively so that workers can protect themselves in the workplace, make sure they have a safe uh, working environment and fair pay for everyone who's working there. Thank you, sir. And your answer. Or did you already answer? I already answered. Okay. <laughs> we're going to move on to our next question, which comes from reporter Tom Jackson. We're having an interesting election this year. I think everybody would agree. Should lawmakers change election law to make it easier to vote? And what changes, if any, in election law do you support? And we'll start with you, State Senator Gavarro. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm the only member of the General Assembly to introduce legislation to address election security. And that uh, has been signed into law and um, really important legislation. I've also uh, sponsored Senate Bill 191, which would allow voters to request an absentee ballot online. And um, it's important. We need to make sure people are able to vote, that uh, people have access to the ballot, and we want to make it as easy as possible and streamline that process. Actually, that's a bill that uh, my opponent has endorsed. And for my work, I was actually um, endorsed by the bipartisan Ohio Association of election officials. Or actually, I was uh, voted Legislator of the Year by the Bipartisan Ohio Association of Election Officials. Very good. And, uh, Thank you for that answer. And candidate Odorizio. We need to expand the franchise to vote. Uh, right now, our Secretary of State is at the cutting edge of disenfranchising voters. Uh, we've seen uh, Frank LaRoe's decision to limit uh, ballot drop boxes being copied in Texas. Uh, it's probably going to be copied in other states. We need to make sure that uh, we, as a nation, when we started out, only landed white citizens could vote. Uh, we expanded that franchise to include African Americans. We expanded that franchise to include women. We need to make sure that uh, every citizen has the, not just the right to vote, but the ability to vote. And anything that we do as a nation to get in the way of that is damaging our democracy. So um, I think we need to have, com we need common sense laws to make sure elections are secure, but we need to make sure that every person can vote. Thank you, sir. And the next question comes from reporter Brandon Adio. Do you support the Emerson Creek Wind Farm proposal in Erie and Huron counties? And do you support construction of windmills over Lake Erie? Why or why not? And what precautions should there be? Candidate Odorisio. Um, Ohio has some of the most restrictive setback laws in the country. Um, you know, we, 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 what, these, um, what these setback requirements do is uh, make it so that you can't put up a, wind far, a windmill within a certain distance of the border of your property. Uh, in some cases, you need to get uh, your neighbor's permission in order to set up a windmill. Uh, what that's done is limit the growth of commercial scale wind farms in our state. Uh, we actually, particularly in our region of the state, we have um, uh, very significant wind. So um, I, I know that farmers would benefit from the ability to put wind farms up on their farms. Uh, each windmill site would create eight to ten thousand dollars a year uh, of income for a farmer who can put up a windmill. So expanding the ability to put up wind in our state would help our economy, uh, would reduce our energy prices, and would bring us in alignment with renewable uh, a renewable portfolio standard that we should be stri striving for. And so, from your answer, is it safe to assume you support the Emerson Creek Wind Farm proposal in here and here in counties? I, I support the expansion of wind energy in Ohio in general. Okay. Yes. And State Senator Gavard, same question. Um, there have been a lot of concerns raised over the windmills, especially in um, Lake Erie. Uh, when we talk about uh, you know, water quality and, and what that means, putting windmills in Lake Erie could be um, it would raise, there have been a lot of concerns raised about what that can mean for the fishing industry and what vibrations would do. And, um, so there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern being raised over that on top of the, the birding migration patterns that come through. So um, I certainly have uh, some concerns 
about um, about those uh, wind farms. Okay. And we'll move on to our last question, I believe, from reporter Tom Jackson. I have a political question. Senator Gavarone, who is your favorite Democrat? And Professor Odorizio, who is your favorite Republican? These individuals can be present day, or if you prefer, historic figures. And we'll start with you, State Senator Gavarone. I had to tell you, um, I, my fa I have two favorite Democrats. Uh, Pat Shenigo and Sheriff Sigsworth. I, and you know why? Because I can call them up and they work, they don't care about party politics, they don't care about party lines. Um, we can, we have conversations, we work together, we get things done, and they're tremendous public servants, both of them. So uh, I, I appreciate the question and uh, certainly appreciate uh, working with these fine leaders. In Thank you for that answer and candidate Odorisio. Historically, I really like Lincoln because he fought to keep our nation together. And right now, I like all of the Republicans that are working for the Lincoln Project for the exact same reason. Very good. Thank you for that answer. And thank you, candidates, for participating in this debate. We're going to go to closing statements, but one more time, I want to mention that this debate has been brought to you by BGSU Firelands College as a public service. And we want to thank BGSU Firelands College for providing support for these five debates, which you can see at the Register's YouTube channel, On Demand, or at SanduskyRegister.com. And with that, our closing statements. 90 seconds. 90 seconds. A minute and a half for closing statements, and I forget who goes first. Sir, you do. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, this is my first time running for office, and I'm doing it because I know that by working together as a community, we can bring positive change to Ohio. Uh, I'm running for office because I want to make sure that our students can afford an education. I'm running for office because I want to make sure that my kids uh, have the same opportunities that I had growing up. And I'm running for office to represent you as a, as a citizen of Ohio and as a citizen of the second district. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, candidate Joe O'Dericio and State Senator Gavarro. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank the Sandusky Register for, um, for putting on this forum today. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, as you know by now, I'm a mother of three, a, a small business owner, um, attorney, former local government, uh, former House rep um, state representative in the House and uh, current senator. And in times like these, experience makes a difference. It, it really means something. But on top of that, um, I've been endorsed by the small business groups, the NFIB, the Ohio Chamber, the Leadership Fund, as well as the Building Trades, um, the IBEW, and the um, Carpenters, and the pipe fitters and others, the operating engineers, but I've also been endorsed by law enforcement and endorsed by the largest teaching organization in the state, the OEA. And I've been endorsed by these groups because they know I'm going to fight to keep Northern Ohio working. I know business. I know the law. I'm also going to fight for your safety and I'm going to fight for your schools and I have a proven track record of working in a bipartisan manner to get the job done. And that's what I'm going to continue to do as your state senator. Thank you, Senator Gavarone, and thank you, candidates, for participating in this debate, which you can watch on demand at SanduskyRegister.com or at the Register's YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us.